nearly 850,000 years ago, inside the shadowed mouth of a cave in what is now northern Spain, a child no older than five met a violent end. The scene, if we could see it, would be as unsettling as anything in human history. A deliberate decapitation, precision cuts to the neck bones, dismemberment, and finally, consumption. The bone surfaces tell the story unflinchingly, slicing marks from stone tools, percussion breaks to access marrow, and even human bite impressions. To the human species that did this, the toddler was not a child in our modern sense, but another source of meat, processed with the same efficiency as the deer and cattle remains found beside them. The Eaters of the Dead belong to Homo antecessor, a species of archaic human known only from the Grand Dolina site in the Atapuerca Mountains. These were tall, powerfully built individuals, with men standing 1.7 meters or more and weighing up to 90 kilos, which is a very stocky 5.5 feet and 200 pounds. Their brain volume hovered around 1,000 cubic centimeters, smaller than ours but near the upper range for Homo erectus. They were skilled hunters, expert butchers, and, as the archaeological record makes clear, eaters of the dead. Yet, for decades, Homo antecessor was also suspected of being something much more significant, the last common ancestor of modern humans and Neanderthals. The modern-looking face of the boy of Grandolina, later resexed as a girl, seemed to bridge the gap between our own features and the more primitive visages of earlier humans. But recent advances in paleoproteomics and genetic modelling have shifted that narrative. Today the consensus is firming around a different conclusion. Homo antecessor was not our direct ancestor, but a side branch, one of several populations living in Eurasia during the Middle Pleistocene that skirted close to the root of the human family tree, and then vanished. When the first remains of Homo antecessor emerged from the sediment, the implications were immediate. Here was a species with a flat mid-face, a defined canine fossa, and a gracile jaw, traits that in modern humans are considered derived compared to the more projecting faces of Neanderthals and Homo heidelbergensis. Its pattern of facial growth, driven by bone resorption rather than heavy forward growth, looks strikingly like ours. Tooth eruption sequences matched our own timing. To many paleoanthropologists, these features screamed ancestral, for a time, it seemed reasonable to position Homo antecessor as the last common ancestor of both Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. In that model, a population in Europe around 850,000 years ago would have given rise to two lineages, one moving toward Neanderthals and Denisovans, the other ultimately toward modern humans. This idea meshed with older molecular clock estimates that placed the sapiens Neanderthal split around 500,000 years ago. But genetic advances in the last decade have pushed that divergence much earlier. Current models, informed by ancient DNA and protein studies, suggest that the Neandersovan and sapiens lineages split closer to 800,000 years ago, perhaps even earlier. That means Homo antecessor, far from being the ancestor of both, may have been a cousin species, living contemporaneously with the true last common ancestor. The paleoproteomic analysis of Homo antecessor tooth enamel, the oldest ancient proteome sequence to date, reinforced this conclusion, placing the species near the root, but not on the direct branch leading to us. Physically, Homo antecessor was a mosaic, part primitive, part forward-looking. Alongside the modern-like face and jaw sat a suite of older features, a receding forehead, a double-arched brow ridge, an absence of a chin, and shovel-shaped incisors with large, robust roots. The skull vault was long and low, with a brain volume smaller than ours, but larger than many earlier humans. The last molars were notably reduced in size, hinting at dietary shifts. The dental record is especially revealing. The roots of the molars and premolars were powerful, a trait more common in archaic humans than in later species. Yet the overall tooth proportions and eruption patterns were more modern than in Neanderthals or Homo erectus. This combination makes Homo antecessor a fascinating transitional form, one that retains primitive chewing architecture while adopting a facial structure we associate with our own species. The violent death of the Grandolina toddler is not an isolated case. 
Across this level of the site, roughly 30% of the hominin bones bear cut marks, percussion fractures, and bite marks from other humans. The processing patterns are identical to those on the bones of hunted animals, with no evidence for ritual handling. Spanish paleoanthropologists have suggested that this anthropophagy, the scientific word for human flesh-eating, was primarily nutritional at the site, perhaps reinforced by territorial competition between small, mobile groups. Why Homo antecessor engaged in such behavior remains speculative. In the resource-rich environment of Atapuerca, 850,000 years ago, meat was abundant, so desperation may not explain it. Instead, anthropologists have floated the possibility of social eaters of the dead, a strategy to deter rivals or even to mark boundaries between groups. The fact that children were among the victims implies that age and social status were no protection. From a taphonomic standpoint, anthropophagy at Grandolina has given modern researchers an unparalleled fossil sample. The thorough defleshing and breakage inadvertently preserved bone surfaces with exceptional clarity, allowing cut marks, tooth impressions, and microscopic wear to survive for nearly a million years. The branching pattern in this new phylogenetic tree represents a modern interpretation of how Middle Pleistocene human lineages are related. Instead of a single linear progression from archaic humans to Homo sapiens, the evidence now supports a more complex model in which multiple related lineages split, evolved in parallel, and in some cases went extinct. This interpretation results in Denisovans and the Cima de los Huesos population being placed as branches within the Neanderthal family, and in Homo heidelbergensis being split into three separate evolutionary streams rather than remaining as one unified species. The Cima de los Huesos fossils, which are approximately 430,000 years old and also come from the Atapuerca Mountains in Spain, have yielded ancient nuclear DNA that shows they belong on the Neanderthal side of the family tree. Although their skeletal form retains some primitive features, genetically they are already part of the Neandersovan clade, which is the shared ancestral group of Neanderthals and Denisovans. This means that the Sema population had already diverged from the modern human line and was evolving along the Neanderthal trajectory. The Denisovans, first identified from remains found in Denisova Cave in Siberia, are genetically a sister group to Neanderthals. They share a more recent common ancestor with Neanderthals than either does with Homo sapiens. Genetic evidence indicates that Neanderthals and Denisovans split from each other after their joint lineage had already separated from that of modern humans, possibly around 700,000 to 800,000 years ago. Because of this, both the Denisovans and the Sema population fall under the same broader Neanderthal branch on the phylogenetic tree. The placement reflects their shared evolutionary heritage and explains why the Denisovans are not positioned as a completely independent branch equidistant between Neanderthals and modern humans. The name Homo heidelbergensis has traditionally been used for a wide range of Middle Pleistocene fossils from Africa, Europe and Asia. These fossils include examples such as Kabwe in Zambia, Bodo in Ethiopia, Petrolona in Greece, Arago in France, and Dali and Jinyushan in China. For many years, these remains were grouped into one species, which some researchers proposed as the common ancestor of both modern humans and Neanderthals. However, detailed morphological and genetic analyses have shown that these fossils do not represent a single unified lineage. Instead, Homo heidelbergensis, in the broad sense, is now understood to be a mixture of at least three distinct populations. The first group consists of European fossils such as Petrolona and Arago, which show features trending toward the Neanderthal pattern. These specimens are best interpreted as early or pre-Neanderthals, directly connected to the lineage that leads to Cima de los Huesos and later to classic Neanderthals. The second group consists of African fossils such as Cabwe and Bodo, which share more in common with early modern humans and may represent ancestors or close relatives of the Homo sapiens lineage. The third group is made up of Asian fossils such as Dali and Jinyushan, which have a mixture of archaic and more modern traits. These represent a separate Eurasian population that was not directly ancestral to either Neanderthals or modern humans, although it may have interacted with both. 
Because of this variation, the phylogenetic tree divides Homo heidelbergensis into three separate branches, each corresponding to one of these geographical and evolutionary pathways. This split visually emphasizes that the traditional Homo heidelbergensis category is no longer seen as a single ancestor for both Neanderthals and modern humans, but rather as a set of regional populations with different evolutionary fates. Homo antecessor, from Grandolina in Atapuerca, and dated to around 850,000 years ago, also has a unique combination of features. It possesses a modern-looking face with a flat midface, a canine fossa, and a gracile jaw, but it also retains a receding forehead, pronounced brow ridges, and large, shovel-shaped incisors. When first described, Homo antecessor was proposed as the last common ancestor of modern humans and Neanderthals, but more recent genetic timing evidence places the split between modern humans and the Neanderthal lineage earlier, around 700,000 to 800,000 years ago. This means that Homo antecessor lived after the separation, and was probably a sister group to the true last common ancestor rather than the ancestor itself. Proteomic studies of Homo antecessor tooth enamel confirm that it is closely related to both Neanderthals and modern humans, but still on a side branch. In the phylogenetic tree, Homo antecessor appears just below the last common ancestor, showing its close but lateral relationship to the two main descendant branches. The last common ancestor itself remains unidentified, but it is to have been a population living in Africa or Southwest Asia around 800,000 years ago. This ancestor would have given rise to the African branch leading to modern humans and to the Eurasian branch leading to Neanderthals and Denisovans. This branching model has several important implications. It confirms that the Neanderthal lineage was already established by the time of the Cima de los Huesos fossils. It shows that Denisovans are not a completely separate lineage, but rather the sister group to Neanderthals. It demonstrates that Homo heidelbergensis was not a single worldwide species, but a loose grade of populations that evolved differently in different regions. Finally, it positions Homo antecessor as a close cousin of the last common ancestor, significant for understanding early Eurasian humans, but not directly ancestral to us. By combining fossil morphology, genetic evidence, and geographical context, the phylogenetic tree offers a clearer and more nuanced picture of human evolution during the Middle Pleistocene. Instead of a straight line from archaic humans to modern humans, it shows a complex network of related populations, some of which contributed to our ancestry and some of which did not. This view recognizes the diversity of human forms during this period and underscores that many evolutionary experiments took place before the emergence of our own species. The reclassification of Homo antecessor as a side branch rather than an ancestor has ripple effects across the human evolutionary tree. If not Homo antecessor, then who was the last common ancestor of Neanderthals, Denisovans and modern humans? Some researchers point to an as-yet unidentified African or Southwest Asian population, living around 900,000 to 800,000 years ago, that seeded multiple Eurasian lineages. In this model, Homo antecessor may have been part of an early wave into Europe that evolved in relative isolation, retaining some primitive traits while independently acquiring a modern-like face. This idea dovetails with patterns seen in other Middle Pleistocene sites. Europe, Africa and Asia at this time were not home to single homogeneous populations but to a patchwork of regional groups. Some were trending toward Neanderthal morphology. Others, like Homo antecessor, leaned toward modern human facial form. These populations met, interbred, and competed, creating a genetic and anatomical mosaic that defies simple phylogenetic trees. Returning to the decapitated child in Grandolina, the forensic details of that death are a reminder that evolution is not a tale of steady moral or cultural progress. The humans of 850,000 years ago, whatever their facial similarities to us, lived in a world where survival was paramount, alliances were fragile, and the boundary between person and prey was permeable. That child's life and death took place within a community genetically close to our own lineage, yet behaviorally alien. 
Importantly, the new family tree distances us from that act in a biological sense. Homo antecessor was not us in the way that Neanderthals were us, close kin with whom we interbred. Instead, they were a sister branch, genetically near but ultimately separate, representing one of several experiments in humanity that middle Pleistocene Eurasia produced. The recognition of Homo antecessor as a side branch reinforces a broader shift in paleoanthropology the abandonment of linear march of progress models in favor of tangled, reticulated networks of populations. Human evolution was not a single trunk sprouting orderly branches, but a braided river with channels that split, merged, and sometimes dried up entirely. In this view, Homo antecessor and many other middle Pleistocene groups were part of a vast web of humans whose interactions, through competition, occasional interbreeding and cultural exchange, shaped the evolutionary landscape from which our own species eventually emerged. The toddler's skull from Grandolina is both a crime scene and a data point. It anchors Homo antecessor firmly in time and space, within a behavioral context that is as stark as it is revealing. The faces of these humans looked like ours. Their hands wielded tools with skill, their bodies were tall, strong, and capable yet their genetic legacy, if any, survives only as distant echoes in the tangled branches of the human tree. The new understanding that Homo antecessor was not our direct ancestor frees us to see them not as primitive versions of ourselves, but as a parallel experiment, one that ended, like so many in our genus, in extinction. In their place, other populations, perhaps in Africa or Southwest Asia, carried forward the traits that would one day define Homo sapiens. In the end, the story of Homo antecessor is a reminder that our evolutionary history is more intricate than once imagined, a history written not just in the lines of our DNA, but in the cut marks on ancient bones, in the shattered skulls of long-dead children, and in the faces of hominins who looked like us but were not us. Their story is a chapter in humanity's broader epic, one that forces us to confront both the nearness and the 